Lindsay Coffey. Wow, what a great time talking to Lindsay. Uh, sustainability. She is an advocate. She goes to Capitol Hill to talk to political leaders. She uh, does a, uh, awareness and community engagement for uh, the World Wildlife Fund, for Echo Branders, for, for, for many uh, firms. Uh, she was Miss Earth 2020, the first American from the States to win the competition. Have you ever heard of Miss Earth um, competition? I have not. You have to you have to have a platform, and then there's many different competition uh, areas that you have to perform in. Fascinating background, really, really terrific energy, terrific energy. Uh, but just um, you wonder, like some of the simple things we could do. We talk about plastics. We talk about her platform was water, by the way, for the for that contest. Things that that are happening now with water uh, that we need to uh, watch out for. She was in South Africa during the big water uh, issue in 2018, where they had a zero day where they were going to run out of water. Interesting take on, on what she did there, but also discipline. You know, uh, her take on that was fascinating as well. Just a great conversation with Lindsay. Time went by so quick. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. The next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family and their passion and their careers and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. And uh, Lindsay Coffee, thank you so much for your time today. What do you miss most about uh, not adopting a highway? Oh, okay. Honestly, I will say one of my regrets in life is whenever I had to give up my highway. And I, oh my goodness, as a middle schooler, though, that preferred to pick up trash on the weekends rather than, I don't know, hang by the pool. I mm. felt like a lot of people thought something was wrong with me, but, but it was really cool adopting a highway. I kept it for, I mean, years and years. And then whenever I moved away, I was like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to maintain it. I'm gonna have to give it up. And I go home so often where that would have been so easy to maintain. And I, I am so sad that mm. I ended up just turning my highway over after just year, years and years of a relationship. Devastating. What's the process of adopting a highway? I see the signs every now and then, but I don't know anything about it. Okay. So again, I was in middle school when this yeah. did occur. So my mom did a that. lot of the talking on the phone, but I'm pretty sure you call. So this was in Pennsylvania. So we called uh, PennDOT uh, and like the department. Department of Transportation, whatever your state is. And we ended up just joining the program via phone. And wow. I don't think we had to fill, I'm sure you had to fill something out, but as a middle schooler, I didn't have to. And um, they provide you with garbage bags, literally free garbage bags for the duration of your adopted highway. And wow. yeah, it was really cool. And they also provide you with gear, uh, um, reflective vests and- yes those signs that you see, those giant orange signs, yeah, with yeah. Markers, they give you all of that. So then you can put it up whenever you're cleaning your highway. So it's safe and you're visible and you have the trash bags and what you need to, in order to pick everything up. So they're really, really great huh. at supplying you with all everything that you do need. So they're a great organization. I'm so sad. I ended up just giving my highway up, my baby, my literal adopted baby. <laughs> It's so cool. And so I'm sure you get yeah, those pickers. So once you get the trash in the bags, do they take them or you got to bring them somewhere? 
No, you just fill up the bag, leave it wherever it's filled and call them, tell them that you just cleaned your highway and then they will send through a truck and go pick it up. So easy. Everyone should adopt adopt a highway. This is my PA, my public service announcement. Everyone adopt a highway. It's super easy. And you get free garbage bags for life (laughs) for your highway. Well, that's really, really cool because I, I, like I said, I see those signs. Uh, probably these days, you could probably do it right on their site, on the website. I would oh, wonder. yeah. It'd be super easy. Just go to your state transportation website and uh, you only have to even do it a minimum of twice a year. So it's super flexible. Huh. Yeah. So, so was this the beginning of your, you know, life activism? I guess you could say that. I never really thought about it because I always... I always cared for nature and it was my emotional outlet whenever I was younger, but I didn't really know that at the time. So I always connected by being in nature and I had a passion for her, but I guess my activism, my actual boots on the ground work probably, yeah, started with that highway. And I always, if I saw somebody just littering, it would just affect me to such a degree. And I felt bad and I loved the animals and I wanted to care for our planet. Mm. And so I guess the way for me to actually do it within my own community on such a, um, a smaller scale, but a feasible scale and a great way to start. And I, yeah, I just, I guess I adopted that highway. Very cool. What's the difference between green wishing and green washing? Oh yeah. That's actually a great question because a lot of people most people hear of green washing, but a lot of people aren't familiar with green wishing. Now, green washing, oh goodness, it's prevalent everywhere with a sure lot of brands is. and companies. It's terrible. And basically, in sum, it's when a company or brand promotes their business or product as more sustainable than it actually is. Mm. And they have nothing to back up their environmental claims. Now, green wishing, which I have some respect for because green wishing you have the intention there. You want to do right and you want to care for the environment Hmm. and you think you are by your actions. However, they're not really making an impact or they're actually somewhat still destructive. Hmm. So the intention again is there and you are trying to do right and be better, but you really lack the knowledge and the awareness that you need in order to actually create that impact. So the difference is in intention, but Hmm. yeah, I'm sure. Have you ever heard of green wishing? I have until I heard you talk about it, but there's, oh my goodness, you know, you got a question, you know, benefit of the doubt, I guess, right? Um, I'm not, but again, I'm sorry. I was also going to say, even when it comes to recycling, there's so much green wishing and recycling where, Mm. okay, I want to recycle this bottle. Let me just throw it in. But actually so many people don't understand how to properly recycle and it leads to improper disposal, which could contaminate the entire batch of properly recycled items. And then all of that now goes to the landfill because maybe that one item was improperly recycled. So, and even just a quick brief rundown, um, we have to make sure our products are like clean and free from contamination to contaminate the actual uh, batch. Uh, There's Hmm. also just improper plastics that you think can be recycled and they're not. And so Mm. a great resource to know is there are seven different types of plastic and four of them are incredibly highly recyclable and others you have to go to an actual store drop-off location rather than your curbside recycling bin. So if you uh, visit, if you even type in the seven different types of plastic on your search engine, they will come up and it'll actually help you decipher which plastic is actually recyclable, which is store drop off or which is just not recyclable at all. But a fun Hmm. tip is when in doubt, throw it out. If you don't know if it's properly recycled, just throw it in the garbage and avoid it. Yeah. Now there's the triangle on the bottom with the number in it. Does that have something to do with it? Yes. So the triangle on the bottom, there's a number one through seven and they, number seven is actually the plastic that is just all other plastics outside of one through six that are not recyclable at all. And those include like CDs and things like that. Uh. Um, there's, uh, so all of them there, I think number one is, um, it, the initials are PP, which is just uh, polyethylene plastic. And it is a very highly recyclable plastic. Um, there's also, I believe this is maybe three or f- three and four, which is a high density polyethylene and then a low density polyethylene, both are highly recyclable. Mm. Um, and those include like milk jugs, water bottles, mm. even the more 
the thicker plastic is the high density polyethylene. And then the low density is like the flimsy paper bags, which also you can't recycle in your curbside right. recycling. They have to go into a separate, more so a store drop off location for that to actually be properly recycled. So there's so much that goes into it. And that's why education is so important, but it's also so inconvenient, which I know you focus on discipline and this is Mm. where discipline comes in. Mm. And it's just being able to educate yourself, know your options, know how to do things properly. And really it honestly just takes like five seconds to look something up. If you haven't memorized it, Mm. what you have to do. And there's also uh, a fun, site called how to recycle.info, I believe. Mm. And that also teaches you really how to do it properly. But um, I know it's like, that's like the deterrent because there's always so much that goes into everything. But mm. I mean, again, it's everything. You're going to find that no matter what you do. And it's just about being able to be disciplined enough to do the right thing that betters yourself, your lifestyle, as well as your community. And Lindsay, the, let's go to greenwashing now. I mean, Europe has just enacted some some changes there. The U.S. is slow to do this. It, it's a, it's upsetting. But the idea that, you know, I like to cook, Lindsay, and just the olive oil, the way that the U.S. treats olive oil, that it's just, you can add, if it's from different countries, they can add other, it's terrible. But in Europe, they, they're very, they're much more strict on that. Why? When are we going to catch up to them? Yes. So the EU ended up um, adding a directive to a piece of legislation, and it is absolutely amazing where they've taken jargon of sustainability from the sustainability Mm. sector, such as uh, sustainable or eco-friendly or Mm. green, anything that just insinuates that you are a green, sustainable company. They completely banned using that green jargon unless you have the claims to support uh, what you were saying. Um, And also they also banned the phrase or they banned labeling your company as sustainable if you only invest in carbon offsets. So carbon offsets Mm. are great. And I encourage that with everyone to incorporate that into their business model because The beauty of it today is that we have so many options on how to incorporate sustainability into our models, but carbon offsetting is the easiest one that you can do because you literally don't have to change a thing when it comes to your business model. Not one thing. All you're doing is investing into a program that offsets your carbon emissions. So that is though also why they added that into the directive because you're actually not doing anything to make your business green you're just investing, you're somewhat profit sharing and investing some of that money into a organization that is offsetting carbon emissions. So I I support that initiative as well, because again, you're still mislabeling, labeling your business if your business model hasn't actually changed. But I still encourage carbon offsetting because again, that's the easiest thing that you can do. But why is why do you think Europe is ahead of us? Uh, 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 when I say us, I mean the states, of course, United States. Why are we behind in that? Europe's way ahead of us in that. This is such a controversial controversial uh, thing I'm about to say, but I feel they're ahead of us in a lot of different ways, mm. and that comes to education, food, healthcare, and hmm. sustainability. They are leaders in sustainability, and uh, even look at Switzerland; they're one of the greenest if not still the greenest nation. Really? On Earth. Yes. They're very, very green. They have an amazing economy and they're a company or company. They're a country to look up to and to idolize. Yeah. And there's numerous countries in Europe that are actually ahead of the United States. And it's saddening because the U S is still a superpower and holds great influence worldwide. Yeah. And even when it does come to our own policy, we've seen policies that have been, uh, created in the U.S. have worldwide international effect and mm. has domino effect into other countries as well. So with U- Europe kind of taking lead in the green race, I do believe mm. the U.S. isn't far behind because, again, whether it's out of ego or out of true love for our planet, they don't want to be last or we don't want to be last because mm. that's usually how things go. And There have already been some policies come into play that we have seen within our nation 
Um, it's just a little bit slow moving. And I personally do lobby on Capitol Hill for a couple organizations yeah. where we push for legislation. And uh, th- that includes more CSR, corporate social responsibility initiatives, um, ESG programs, which are um, environment or ESG strategies, which are environmental, social and governance and EPR programs, which are extended producer um Right, extended producer responsibility programs. Saying so many acronyms at yeah. once is very confusing. Um, so we are really trying to fight for that type of policy, and we are seeing progress. It's just progress is very slow. And even the term organic gets thrown around here in the states. It's not really organic, even if it says. Yeah, and there's also a piece of legislation where I think you have to qualify at least. Oh goodness! A certain percentage of it has to be organic mm. for you to even claim that it could even be a hundred percent organic. So that's also another area that's an issue where there are so many companies that are doing things very unethically, and they lack the transparency that the consumer needs to be fully knowledgeable about the product that they're purchasing. And we need change on a global scale. And that change has to come from our government, from our companies Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. from consumers. And there's a lot of power that lies within the the choice of the consumer. And there's an unfair burden that that falls on the consumer because they have to do their own research to find out what product is that they're, the product that they're actually purchasing and the impact that it has, whether it's positive or negative. So the EPR programs, extended producer responsibility, that will hold the companies accountable for their actions and to display transparency and uh, include verifiable certifications and uh, transparency within their supply chain to tell the consumer exactly where their product has come from. Um, so we're looking mm-hmm. forward to seeing more of that. And that's something we just we really don't have a lot of right now. So a lot of that falls on the consumer. Yeah, we have a lot of power as the consumer and the voter and, the, you know, the people have power and um, uh, we have to really put it on display. You were the first American to win Miss Earth 2020. Tell me about that competition, please. Yes. So um, that was crazy. I ended up being, yes, the first U.S. representative to win Miss Earth. And that was just a whirlwind experience. I ended up also sacrificing a lot as well as uh, my profession. I've been modeling for over a decade now, and I even had an agency drop me while I was pursuing this. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, the easiest uh, experience. And also because I had never competed in a competition like this before. And for those who don't know, um, and also don't feel bad because I didn't even know what it was when I joined. So um, before I joined and Miss Earth is an environmental competition and they take on the form of pageantry, but they have a platform of sustainability, environmental preservation, climate justice. And that's been their message and their platform since its inception in 2001. And no U.S. representative has ever won the international title. So I ended up, somebody told me about the competition. I read about it and stood for everything that I believed in. And it also isn't a typical quote unquote beauty pageant, whereas they don't limit you on your physicality. And it's women from all backgrounds, all socioeconomic statuses, all um, different shapes and sizes. And it's really about what you have to say. And I appreciated that. So I ended up joining. Very, very nervous. I had no idea what I was doing. And I ended up winning nationals where I became Miss Earth USA. And I went on to internationals where I competed against 82 different nations. And I ended up becoming the first, yes, U.S. representative to win. And it was a rigorous three, four month process of interviews at like two in the morning because they're worldwide. So I'm talking Mm. to somebody in Australia at two in the morning and you have to know your topic and the platform you wish to preach. Mine was the water Mm. crisis at the time. And if you don't know what you're talking about, the entire world will be able to know. And you can easily separate the people who are there for the right reasons and those who are not. So you can be asked anything from, oh my goodness, just environmental policy within your nation, within other countries, uh, Mm. sustainable solutions, the problems that we're facing, uh, green tech. It just 
across the board. And it was, it was a lot. So I learned a lot about myself in that process, gained discipline. And most importantly, I gained confidence because I felt very underqualified considering my current career and thinking people wouldn't take me seriously. So Mm. it was quite the journey. You said it was easy to kind of sniff out those who didn't have a great platform to stand on. Explain. So there are some uh, contestants, they would advocate for possibly uh, pollution and like plastic pollution, I guess, since we were talking about plastics. And that is an issue. However, that's solving the plastic crisis. That's not going to solve the environmental crisis worldwide and Mm. plastic pollution and pollution really in general is such an easy, I don't want to say cop out, but it's such an easy focus where you really don't have to learn a lot. And Hmm. it's one of the things where if you were to ask somebody, what do you think is killing our planet? And if they say pollution, that's just such an easy answer. It's right, but it's also, you can go so much more in depth and Mm. have a deeper understanding of the things that we actually have to do. The actual problems as to why we are polluted um, and the solutions that we have to depollute and um, even possible legislation that is currently going on or that we need to see in order to get this going. So it's so much more, it's such a wide breadth of an area. And whenever you, they would kind of focus on such a vague topic without going really, really in depth. And so, Mm. and then whenever they were asked follow-up questions about it, sometimes they really, they either didn't answer the question and shifted to something else, which again is a great tactic if you don't know the answer, um, or they really just didn't, they gave another vague question. So Mm. you could really just tell, because I'm telling you, these interviews were so in-depth and- really you could really tell who actually did the research and knew what they were talking mm. about versus someone who's just being vague and not very descriptive. Other than the knowledge of your, your given subject or your, you know, your, your given direction, what other um, areas did you have to compete in? So there's also still some of the pageantry involved where we had evening gown talent ah. where, yeah. So I always like to call it very strategic and marketing. We've seen some honestly marketing geniuses in this lifetime and how they ended up really pushing out their platform is it's kind of like window shopping. So if you're walking down the street and you see this dress that you really like and it captures your attention And then you want to explore inside the store now. So that's kind of what they did where they focused on the frills and glamour of, you know, the evening gown, the swimwear, the the talent portion, and just fun things to do just to keep you entertained and engaged. So that's kind of like the window shopping. They see that, they get you at the window, and then that will bring you into the store. So you actually look around and you realize that these women actually have something to say. Hmm. And so that I thought was very strategic of a play on their part. Very interesting. And only women. Yes. At, at the time. I'm not sure if I think there was also a Mr. Earth once upon a time, but I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But I only know, yes, of Miss Earth where it's just uh, uh, females competing. And what were the responsibilities that once you were Miss Earth, what did you need to do? So you end up having a year of a reign and I ended up traveling internationally to multiple countries, speaking at seminars. Um participating in events, also in webinars as well, a lot of virtual. And I would also attend other competitions internationally to assist the girls and to inspire them and to help guide them. And just also overall encourage the my platform to help other people just discover sustainability, mm. how they can incorporate in, into their lives, really inspire them to take action and really even just to educate them. So if they're not willing to, you know, become a climate activist, which you really don't have to, but just to have that awareness that you know that there's something going on, awareness is the first step to change. So that was my goal is just to bring awareness and to help share and spread the mission of Miss Earth, which was my mission as well. Hmm. You said that your platform was the water crisis. What should we know about the water crisis? Has it changed Has it, since uh, 2020? So it's now four years later. So the water crisis 
it's there's so much that goes into the water crisis where it also includes water pollution and it includes droughts uh being able to have the appropriate amount of water distributed whenever it comes to agriculture because a lot of waste and water goes into that um, as well. I think it's actually one of the higher percentages of water waste um, within any other sector, along with the fashion industry. Um, And Mm. there's also, speaking of droughts, as I just mentioned, one of the natural disasters that I had lived through was in South Africa during the water crisis that made international headlines. And are you familiar with that? No, what happened? So back in 2018, uh, Cape Town ended up experiencing a water crisis where they ended up running out of water. And yeah, and so they coined a phrase called day zero. And there was a literal countdown to the day that we would run out of water. And it was absolutely terrifying. It completely, I mean, changed my perspective and my life because I had to alter my life in a way that I never thought I would have to. And Mm. water, which is a necessity, became a luxury. And I easily, I wanted to run back to America where I didn't have to face that problem. But I also thought, sure, Cape Town's one of the first countries to run out of, the, run out of water, but I knew that they weren't going to be the last. And I ended up staying with everyone else and I endured and I celebrated with the country when we didn't run out of water. And mm-hmm. there's so much waste when it comes to water where, again, it is a necessity, but people also still treat it like a luxury for those that have it Mm. and they don't know what it's like to experience it when they don't. And so it was very eye opening to me. And even just here in the U S people will run water. They'll take 45 minute showers. They brush their teeth with with the water running or um, there's just so many small things that we do that we're actually just wasting so much water and that's within our own personal lives. So just imagine all of the wastewater that we have in the fashion industry, the textile industry, um, and man- manufacturing and agriculture. So uh, there was a lot that went into it. Also encouraging more rainwater harvesting programs, because even in California, rainwater harvesting used to be illegal. It's not anymore. So um, that was another thing that we wanted to see come to light, because rainwater harvesting is an amazing solution, especially mm. if you harvest rainwater in your own backyard. And then you can have really unlimited water depending on the, well, the weather. Mm, (laughs) So, mm. um, there's water, there's only, I believe 3% of fresh water worldwide and 2% of it is frozen in the poles. So that only leaves 1% of fresh water. And with how things are going, the way that we're wasting our resources and also with, uh, population, there's not going to be enough water or food to, secure humanity in the future. And it's Mm. about making better choices now in order to secure the resources that we have. Where are, Lindsay, where are we with the desalinization? I mean, the planet's 75% water, for goodness sakes. Why why are these brilliant engineers working on that? So we do have desalination plants. And for those who don't know, it's basically just removing salt out of the water and turning into fresh water. And We do have some, but there's so many things that are holding us back from it. And most of it is like a lack of infrastructure and a lack of technology in order to Mm. um, incorporate desalination plants on a larger scale. So I'm not in the green tech field as an actual, Mm. um, like, you know, tech technician, but, or an engineer. Uh, But a lot of the issues that stand in our way of becoming greener is, is the infrastructure and it is the technology. And even when we have some of that, we don't have the investment or the capital in order to create these plants. And mm. um, we, we also don't have the demand for it. And that also even can fall back onto consumerism again, because, you know, consumers control market plan, market trends. We, mm. what we demand, they must supply. So even if we turn that into infrastructure, if the masses end up demanding desalination plants, especially within their community, starting small, working on the local level, that can turn into a global level. And so it's really about using your voice and again, the choices that we make. And that quite literally will be able to change our future and the future of our planet. Yeah, very well said. I, I and, and in, in what you said, it's uh, it doesn't make enough money yet for them to do it. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. If they can make a lot of money doing it, I think that that'll be the shift. But 
I know like Saudi Arabia, I think has like one of the largest desalinization plants where they're just bringing everything in. Uh, certainly they got unlimited funds. So you do a lot of community engagement, impact awareness, you know, with the, the, the world wildlife fund, which you uh, said that some people think is wrestling, which is, they won the logo for that. So they, yes. yeah. They which I don't even know why they went to court. They were of course going to lose, but I appreciate the fight, you know, if you have it in you, fight for it. And so what do you do for, like, for example, for the World Wildlife Fund? You're an ambassador so there. They're one of the organizations, along with Remake, um, that I will volunteer and advocate for certain policies and legislation on Capitol Hill in D.C. And I also will do projects just throughout the year in the name of WWF, which is really just mm. raising awareness about a certain topic or conducting a presentation at a school. Uh, because, again, I'm very a firm believer in education and uh, trying to also inspire others to want to do the same and really just continue to help promote the, the mission. And even with uh, Remake, it's very similar as well. I've also lobbied for on behalf of Remake. And the difference is they, they focus on climate justice within the fashion industry. And they mm. also advocate for uh, workers' rights, um, well, for garment workers. And so to provide them a safe working environment, as well as a livable wage because honestly garment workers today in the fashion industry it is modern day slavery and a lot of people also aren't familiar with that and it's just mm. about educating yourself on that topic and i also um am the head of community uh, engagement and impact awareness at eco branders which is the first one of the first uh, eco-conscious brandable merchandise retailers in the u.s and i also speak on behalf of them to help transform the business and marketing sectors and create a new culture and a new space for consumerism with a new mindset and to shift our societal values into in a more productive and beneficial way. Um, and so they're great as well because they're actually showing how you can have purpose and profit within your mm -hmm. business. And uh, they're really setting an example. And I love being a part of them as their organization as well. Yeah, they sound like great organizations. Why is the fashion industry, which I know very little about, might you might be shocked to hear that, and uh, why is it so unclimate friendly? Oh, goodness. Okay, well, definitely a lot of wastewater, as I mentioned, and wow. um, uh, that leads just to so much water contamination through just chemicals, tox just so much toxicity, whether it's chemicals, really? heavy metals, dyes, and it contaminates not just rivers and fresh water that we can use, but it also completely destroys ecosystems and it changes the habitat within that ecosystem for our marine life. And wow. it will completely disrupt uh, how they operate and function. It will impact their behavior and it will disrupt their hormones. It will impact reproductive uh, reproduction. And then we also have so much deforestation contributing to um, knocking down trees in order to either create fabric or other products out of virgin wood. And meanwhile, we have so many other textiles that we can use that are equally, if not more effective hmm. and also more exciting because I even own products that are leather, but they're made, they're vegan leather. They're made out of pineapple, mushroom, apples, banana peels. Oh. Who knew that this was, this existed? Have you ever heard of that? No. Not it's, pineapple and apples. Yes, it's it's fascinating. I think the pineapple leather, it's actually called like Pinotex or something. Um, and even mushrooms alone, honestly, mushrooms, I feel single-handedly can just save yeah. the entire planet and yes. also our individual health. Um, but then also just when it comes to fashion, I believe uh, 85 just percent of textiles end up in the landfill each year. And U.S. consumers, wow. they throw away 81 and a half pounds of clothing each year. That's a small person that like you're mm. just tossing away each year. And it's it's really devastating what fast fashion has done hmm. to our planet and honestly, even to our mindset, because there's a lot of psychology when it comes to purchasing and the society, the culture that we've created because of the fashion industry, which is one of the most detrimental industries to our planet. Wow, wow. It's 
is it's baffling. And there's so many people that aren't familiar with the effects of it. And like even from a humanitarian side, as I mentioned with the garment workers, but also just from an environmental side where they understand, okay, yes, it contributes to pollution, uh, land, water, and air. It um, does destroy ecosystems and contributes to deforestation, but they don't understand the extent of it. And they don't understand the full impact that it has on our environment. And we've even seen so many of the chemicals and dyes that have been released in the waterways that um, contribute to cancer and Mm. um, other health issues and respiratory infections. So there's so much that goes into it and life is interdependent. So everything that we do, there is going to be an effect. It's, it's a consequence. And that even leads me to the power of the choices that we make with every choice that we have has a consequence. And it really is up to us as to whether that consequence is positive or negative. I did not realize that with the fashion industry, you mentioned, uh, you're on Capitol Hill often. Tell me what that's like, Lindsay. I mean, you, you talk with senators with and and politicians. I mean, what's on their mind? There are there. I, I, what paint a picture for me? There, it's so lobbying is one of the most rewarding parts of my activism. Really? And, oh my goodness! I encourage everyone to do it. It is so empowering. Being even if you want to start on on a local level, just within your community, your municipality. And then maybe work to DC, but being able to be on Capitol Hill where just the foundation of our society and how it was constructed just became, that came into existence and is still today, Hmm. being able to talk to the people, the powerful people that they listen to, their job is to listen to our voice so that their voice can help carry on our values and to help create the world that we wish to see. It's so empowering knowing that you just have that connection with that person where you usually only see these people and these their names on a ballot or on TV or if you read about it but mm. if you just make the journey to either your local office or to Capitol Hill you're able to actually speak to your representative voice your concerns let them hear your testimony tell them what's going on in your community because they work for you and again, goes back to the power of choice where, yes, we are consumers, we are constituents, Mm. we have the ability to control our future. And that's why we cannot fear our future because we have the the ability to create it. And by doing that through legislation, that's the way to go because I feel any issue in society, in today's world, the truest solution is through the legislative branch. And being able to just sit there in your state senators and representatives office and tell them exactly how your life is, what you've seen, what you've experienced, that will help them better do their job and Mm. better be an advocate for you. And that's what we need more of because a lot of people are quiet because they think that their voice doesn't carry, but it carries so far if you just give yourself the opportunity to actually speak. And when you go to them, you're talking about some of these eco-friendly initiatives, obviously. Yes. So sometimes there will be some bills that have already been introduced and we're there to show some support. Um, Ah. Like whether it's the past uh, for WWF, we were discussing some bottle bills and plastic initiatives Uh, for Remake. We were advocating for the Fabric Act, which will completely redesign the American garment manufacturing industry. And what I really appreciated with Remake was we had testimonies from actual garment workers and our representatives were able to hear them personally speak on their experience in these sweatshops, uh, working a non-livable wage, uh, detailing the effects on their mental and physical health, their just overall well-being. And it was, I get chills thinking about it because it was so heartbreaking to hear, but it was something you had to hear. And if we weren't there, that representative would never have heard her story. And Mm. that's what lobbying is about. And it's about sharing your experience, sharing your story. And that's the only way we can actually affect change is whenever people speak up and share share what's happening because that's the only way that people are ever going to know about it. Mm. So, and then again, you have to keep on speaking because also a lot in the, in politics as well, it's a very 
difficult and tricky area to navigate. And so you just have to keep being persistent and keep on sharing your voice and your story so people can hear you. What is some things, Lindsay, we can do just generally as a public to, you know, to forward sustainability? Again, raising awareness and education is Mm. the foundation for change. So you can educate yourself, educate your family and friends, or educate others on a larger scale. So I would say first and foremost, it's about finding something you're passionate about and educating yourself and then educating others. And then also falls back on consumer choices. Again, we control and dictate market trends. So being able to be uh, purchased mindfully, and there are resources that we can use that kind of take out the the hard work and do that research for us, such as goodonyou.eco and at remake.world, they have a brand directory. So you just search in a brand and you can see how sustainable these brands are. And again, supporting government regulations and policies, showing support for those initiatives on a local and global scale. And voting is the number one thing that we can do Mm. as citizens, as constituents, because that's how our voice is heard and we're stronger in numbers. And encouraging corporate responsibility, again, with Mm. supply and demand. If we're demanding something, they have to supply it. So if we're demanding ethical sourcing, recyclable materials, more eco-friendly materials, then they're going to have to supply it. And Overall, it's about also encouraging a circular economy and not only having them provide the products that we want, but how we want to see their life cycle. And so many corporations, they will create this product, but they don't consider the end of life of that product. And that falls onto the consumer who is not educated on how to dispose Mm. or properly care for this item. But if we create a circular economy where when that product is disposed of, it actually goes back in to, turns into another textile or it is recycled or it just is upcycled into something else. And we just continue having that circular loop where we're not creating waste, we're creating other textiles to be used again. So there's so many different things that we can do and our options are endless where you really just have to pick an option or a strategy that's suitable for you and your life Because a lot of people, I think, are deterred by the fact that they have to go zero waste or become a vegan or Mm. do something to the extreme. But really, that's not the case at all. All you have to do is just choose what's best for you in the lifestyle that you are living and just educate yourself on those options. It's not always about even doing the right thing all the time. Sometimes it's about choosing the lesser of two evils. You know, Mm. we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be mindful. Where do you stand on carnivore versus vegetarian diet as far as sustainability? So I have so many friends that ask me, like, can I, especially new friends, is it okay if I eat meat in front of you? I don't care. You oh, you're a vegetarian. Oh, yes, I'm a vegetarian. I see. So, I see. so I don't care if you eat meat in front of me, you go ahead. I'm just not going to eat it. Um, when it comes to veganism and vegetarianism, I never promote that or push that on someone. But when you are mindful of the facts, just even speaking of the water crisis, again, going back to agriculture, there's so much wastewater within farming. And Mm. when, if you switch to just, oh goodness, just even one meal a week, that's vegetarian, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it significantly reduces your environmental impact and your limits your wastewater as well. Mm. So, and it's just literally one day a week. So the six days of the six days that you have left, eat all the meat you want, go mm. barbaric. Just one day can actually have a significant impact. And I also do, I would like to see more humane treatment of animals as well. And a lot of people don't understand what's going on behind those closed doors. And when they do see those videos surface, they can't watch it because Mm. that has an emotional impact on them. And you even hear people say, oh, now I can't eat meat anymore. This is going to stop me. Or I can't eat a burger after I just witnessed how they slaughtered this cow. And it affects them. So that's why obviously they keep this behind closed doors. So you don't see and you don't know what's happening. But if we can lift the veil and show how people are treating other 
species just treating life it's Mm. torturous and it's inhumane and it's really despicable and it should be illegal and there are many laws advocating for animal rights as well but again behind closed doors it's very hard to to regulate and push those policies on those companies especially if they're private companies so if you can focus on local sourcing of your food if you also eat organic if you have there's also options when it comes to chicken if you have free range or uh, vegetarian fed hens uh if you also have, what is it? There's also organic as well, meaning that they were just feeding, fed an organic diet. Uh, grass fed. fed. Grass yeah. fed, yes. Mm-hmm. And so there's just so many different ones that you can choose from that are coming from an open range, humanely treated and humanely grown uh, just farm. So it's really about educating yourself on your options and what's happening behind closed doors that you're not familiar with. And I truly believe inaction isn't from a lack of knowledge. It's from, or I'm sorry, isn't from a lack of caring, but rather a lack of knowledge. And Mm. if people understand what's actually happening in this world, they will want to change it. Yeah. Well said. So Lindsay, I started my business. I'm just a little bit older than you. And uh, I started my business back in the 90s and I was working way too hard and um, I'm not paying attention to my diet. I was 14 hour days. I was drinking terrible soda and, and you know, pizza. And I got myself up to 340 pounds. And the, the doctor said to me, if I don't lose the weight, not going to see my daughter graduate. My oldest was just born. So I took the next six, seven months, lost about 130 pounds, kept it off. People always want a quick answer. I'm sure when they come to you, you know, how can I save the planet? Tell me in a sentence. And you know, it's not that simple, but my simple answer to how I lost the weight and keep it off is discipline. You mentioned it before. I, you know, I created a routine, I willpower. All of a sudden I have a mission because I have this little, girl that I've helped bring into this planet somehow. And now I'm responsible for that. And so I I was able to do it and keep it off and I maintain it. I wonder how discipline plays a role in your life. Lindsay Coffey. Oh goodness. Discipline. Firstly, I commend you for your journey Mm. into discipline and having really a life changing journey for you. That's absolutely incredible. And I commend you for that. And that's a true inspiration to myself and I'm sure many, many others. Mm. So I'm sure that wasn't easy as well. It never is. <laughs> but uh, within my own life, I showcase my discipline in so many different ways. And mm. I'm consistently educating myself on sustainability. I'm attending events for networking, um, just for the purpose of being able to connect with others. And really how I even define discipline it's not even profound. I just define it as doing something you don't want to do. So mm. there are so many times mm. where I've, I hadn't wanted, I didn't want to educate myself. I didn't want to read an article. I wanted to watch Netflix, but I had to read the article anyway. I didn't want to go to an event. I just wanted to be a couch potato, but I went mm. to the event anyway. Mm. And also resisting temptation when it comes to buying things, because that is such an issue with our culture today is that mindful consumption or mindless consumption. Mm. And I, avoid those dopamine hits that we're addicted to. And if someone's even handing out swag at a convention, I'll ask myself, am I actually going to use it? Or do I just want that quick dopamine hit to like get as many things as I can for free? And even on a smaller scale, in my discipline shown when I carry my water bottle, my bamboo water bottle everywhere I go, which is still an inconvenience at times. And especially if I'm only wearing a fanny pack, I'll have I'll roll up a tote bag to keep it in the fanny pack in case I do buy something to limit my plastic consumption. And there's also been so many times where I have purchased something. I didn't have a bag, but I went out of my way to avoid using a plastic bag. And I just carried everything in my arms with things falling on the ground just to avoid that plastic bag because I would rather add five seconds of inconvenience to my life while I walk to my car than to just exacerbate the problem. Mm. So I try my best to purchase mindfully and I focus on my actions. And even when I own fast fashion, I, when I give into it, cause again, we're not all perfect. I, 
I don't throw it away when it breaks down. I either repair it or I repurpose it and I change it into something else. And I also unplug everything before I leave my apartment. So mm. there's really? so many, yeah, there's so many things that I've just incorporated into my life where it has become habitual. And it's just knowing that you can act with intention every choice that you make you just have to be you have to pause and be mindful about it because discipline it's it's that foundation for achieving success and fulfillment in both your professional and your personal life and it creates that structure and consistency that you need in order to continuously progress forward and it helps you become more thoughtful and informed with your decisions rather than just make impulsive ones, which is what we, what we do. So it it involves evaluating our options, considering the long-term consequences, and then you act accordingly. So that's how discipline really shows up in my life. Very well said. I I like, I like the approach and I've heard that before, not quite that way, but it's just doing something you don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah, the whole idea of, uh, I don't know where some people got this, but even when it comes to eating, the, like everything you put in your mouth has to be a party. I mean, not, you know, suffering a little bit is not bad for you. You know, it's, um, it, it builds character. And sometimes you're going to eat things that don't taste like sugar. Um, yeah. And doing things that you don't yeah, uh, want to do is, is, a, is, a, is, is builds a lot of strength, I believe. It looks like you do as well. Do you drink a lot of coffee, Lindsay? I've actually never drank coffee. <laughs> in your life? In my life, despite my last name. Yeah, your coffee. last name. Uh-huh. I know. I feel like I'm actually doing a disservice to my family because I don't drink it. But um, And I also love using the quote from Green Mile, that movie uh, yeah. with John Coffee. I'm like, my name's uh, Coffee, like the drink, but spelled different because it's spelled E-Y. But right. um, I also forget I'm not the youngest person in the room anymore. So some people don't understand that reference when I say it. But um, yeah, I've never, ever drank coffee. Once in Italy, I did have an, I tried an espresso and it was tolerable, but I was just like, okay. I think it all falls back to when I was young. My mom is a coffee addict. So when she allowed me to have a sip of her cold coffee, I was just like, absolutely no, thank you. I will never drink that again. So do you drink a lot of coffee? Never had it in my life. (gasps) And the same thing. My mother was a big coffee drinker, and I remember she, she had to kick the habit, and she was the meanest person for a month or whatever it was, and it just stuck into me. But I've never, I've never had it. You know what? I think we had the same childhood because I remember my mom even saying like, "Don't talk to her." She like, I haven't had my coffee yet, and I was right. like, "I don't want to be that person." And I think maybe deep down it affected us, yeah, to the point subconsciously even. We just didn't want to be what coffee created people to be. I don't know. I, I you know, I, I go sometimes I'm at the airport early in the morning going somewhere, and you know, there's a long line of these people just jonesing to get it. And it's just, <laughs> and, and I've gone this far without it. Why start? Why start? I know I don't get it. I will stand in line at a cafe because I will say my weakness is hot chocolate. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a problem, but, um, yeah, it's very funny that I've never I've never met a non coffee drinker. Yeah, as well. not once, not once. Yeah. My father's from Italy too. I've been there many times, and yeah, espresso, all the stuff, it just doesn't do anything for me. If I'm forced to get something, I'll get tea or I'll get hot chocolate. But uh, yeah, yeah okay. just, what I love about, what I love about Italy, I've also lived there, and there's literal vending machines with coffee, <laughs> but also yeah. hot cocoa. Like there's also yeah. hot chocolate in these vending yeah. machines on every street corner. And I would just get just two. And they're also very tiny too, which I appreciate, but I would get just like two mini shots of hot chocolate. And I would just like, and they were like 50 cents. (laughs) And I would just get them like every, every corner of the street. Hot chocolate. That's so cool. What motivates you, Lindsay? (sighs) Honestly, becoming the best version of myself and Mm. Helping to heal people and heal this planet because I truly believe that's my life purpose. And in order to accomplish that purpose, it really will help if I do become the greatest version that I can be. Mm. What about you? Let's see. How's, how's that measured? How, how, how can you be the best version? How do you measure success? That is so tough. But yeah. it's also about we all have this idea of who we wish to be. Mm. But 
This could also, you know, be controversial in a sense, not too much, but hard maybe to grasp the concept. There are so many people, another issue with society that we see today is there are so many people that either are living mentally in the past or in the future, and they fail to live in the present moment. And Mm. it's so important to live in the present because the present moment is the only moment that we have and the only only moment that we will ever have. It's Mm. the only moment that will ever exist. So who we are in this moment is such an important role in the development of us because we can change our entire life with just a switch of one mindset in one second. You, that's again, falling back on the choices that we make and how they define us and define our lives. But it is never too late to become the person that you wish to be because in this moment that you have, you can be anyone that you want to be. You can Mm. change your mindset in a split of a second. You can uh, make a different decision. You can take a different route home. You can do something just different because this is the moment that we have to act upon because it is the only moment we can ever act upon. And it's about being so mindful in my own life of what I'm doing in this present moment that will help me get to be that best version of myself. And every choice that we make sets us up for that success. And Mm. that is what I always try and be mindful about is focusing on my choices in this very present moment that I can make to strive for that person that I always wanted to be. Because it's about shifting. A lot of people say, I want to be this whenever, and they speak in future tense, when really they need to shift that and turn it into the present tense and say, Mm. I want to be this person now. And so I'm going to take the steps in order for me to create that person now. Mm. So that's how I think about it. Lizzie, you you got such a uh, wide, oh my, of interest, such a a deep background. You traveled so much with your experiences. You're doing so much, you know, advocacy. What do you do to unwind? So... I do tend to binge watch when I can, but also I will say I haven't even been able to, um, I even had, I haven't had able to, I haven't had, goodness, I cannot speak right now. (laughs) I haven't had time to even watch TV or binge watch. Mm. I don't even own a TV, so I'll use my laptop, but I haven't had much time for that. But how I really, really like to disconnect if again, if I'm in the mood for it, I really do like to read a great book, yeah. um, meditate, which I have to get better at that as well. And that involves discipline and just focusing on self-care and what I need in the moment to, and sometimes that is just to disconnect and let my mind yeah. wander or uh, become numb to my surroundings and just focus on, yes, binge watching a new show. Um and sometimes, yeah, you have to scroll on social media, which I don't do often, but um, I will at least alert some time for me to just spend on there and just have something that's mindless because it is hard to always be on. It's kind of really impossible. Yeah. Do you have any of your, what's your like go-to to unwind? Oh, I've got some athletic en- endeavors that I, you know, I turn off the cell phone, I play golf, I play tennis, so I get to nice. sweat. And, you know, I'm, a, you know, the phone stays in the car, you know, and, you know, I swear and I, you know, I try to get better at it. And, you know, so those are just really, I, I purposely do that away and it gets a lot of aggression. I have a sense of competition as well. So those are the great outlets for me. Oh, absolutely. And I agree with you uh, just about the sport and being active. I'm a huge nature buff. So if I have the time to actually even take a getaway and go hiking, nice. you can't hike in New York, uh, you can go to Central Park and walk some pavements, but that's about it. Yeah. Uh, so if I actually have time to just go out and spend time in nature, even if that is just like Prospect Park or Central Park, mm. it is so relaxing just to hear nature around you. And, and I also have a motorcycle. So sometimes I like to take her out yeah. if I if I can, because again, um, you need the right scenery to really, you know, you don't want to ride down a highway. So Right. Uh, and your motorcycle's a she. That's pretty cool. Yes, her uh, name is Anastasia. Ah, New York is a very, very large state. You go just west. Get a, I know you don't like to leave the city, but there's so much to do up in Erie and, you know, in the Finger Lakes. And I would go to Erie all the time. That's where my dad grew up. 
Yeah. yeah. And so I actually do love to leave the city and yeah. um, not all, I do prefer the city, but since I grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, my hometown, I mean, more cows and people, very, very small, mm. everyone's middle name. So I, I will go back there about once a month and that's where I'll also ride my motorcycle and it's more scenic. There are animals around, it's more nature-esque. So it is a nice disconnect from the city. And I really do appreciate that time. And also oh. even my drive, because it's like an eight hour drive yeah. and I will listen to podcasts or oh. uh, some type of show or book on my phone. And that's also a great way for me to unwind and have the windows down, the podcast mm. on and just, you know, hair blown in the wind. Very cool. Lindsay Coffee, such a great pleasure. I was so excited when we set this up and um, I, I love what you do and I love your energy. If anybody listening, how can they get in touch with you? Yes. So they can find me on my website at lindsay-coffee.com and Lindsay and coffee is spelled E-Y, like the drink, but spelled different. Yeah. And so uh, you can also find me on my social handle, mainly across the board. It's Lindsay Marie Coffee. And I would love if anyone had any questions, please feel free to reach out any ways to incorporate sustainability within their own life or even within their business as I do advocate for that um, through EcoBrainers and just any way to even involve yourself. If you want to do more volunteer work, I would love to hear from you. And I had such a great time talking to you. So thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your platform. And I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. You're there yep. all at uh, Lindsay Marie all Coffee, across. like you said. Yeah, EY and both Lindsay and Coffee. Thank you so much for your time. If I'm ever in the city again, perhaps we'll get some hot chocolate. Yes. And there's also some sugar free hot chocolate. You know, ah, so you try. I wonder. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. You have a great day. Arrivederci. Thank you. Arrivederci. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Podcast information, the video version of our podcast is on YouTube. Please subscribe. Audio is on all major podcasting platforms. Please follow them. And if you like it, please consider giving five-star rating. Would really appreciate that. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversation.